Declarations of War The Ultimatum Count Berthold had ordered the ultimatum to be presented to Serbia at 6 o'clock in the evening on Thursday the 23rd of July. Originally, it had been 5 o'clock, but Berthold delayed delivery for one hour in order to make sure that President Poincaré and the French Prime Minister Viviani should have actually left St. Petersburg on their journey home. The German Chancellor and Foreign Secretary did not see the text till the afternoon before. They were startled by its character, but nevertheless did not recall or alter the German circular note already dispatched to guide their ambassadors in London, Paris and St. Petersburg, declaring that the Austrian demands were moderate and proper. The ultimatum required compliance by Serbia within 48 hours. The Serbian Reply The Serbian reply had been handed to Gilsh in Belgrade at 6pm on Saturday the 25th. Its submissive character was known all over the world on Sunday morning. Its actual text was not officially telegraphed. It reached London, Paris and Berlin by post early on Monday the 27th. The Serbian minister in Berlin gave it to the German Foreign Office in the morning and about noon it was handed to Herr von Jago. All this is certain. The Kaiser had returned to Germany from his cruise in the Norwegian fjords on the night of the 26th in a very warlike mood. The intemperate minutes which he had scribbled upon the telegrams received at sea convict him of this. At three o'clock in the afternoon on the 27th he held a conference of his executive officers of state and war. The Chancellor was there and the Chief of Staffs. Jago was there but he had not brought the Serbian reply with him. The Emperor was told verbally that it agreed on nearly all the points including the punishment of the officers. He was not told in such a way as to make any decided impression upon him in the general stress. The conference concerned itself with military measures and precautions and separated in a spirit of resolve to fight the business through, cost what it may. This at least was the information conveyed to Falkenhayn, not himself present at the meeting. Jago returned to Berlin and during the evening received Monsieur Jules Cambot, the French ambassador, who asked him about the Serbian answer. He said that he had not yet had time to read it. Nearly 48 hours had already passed since it had been tendered in Belgrade. The Kaiser's Minute During the evening of the 27th, the Wilhelmstrasse completed their arduous task of making a fair copy of the document for the Kaiser. This was sent off by special messenger at 9.30pm to the palace at Potsdam, 18 miles away. Incredible as it may seem, the Kaiser, as we are assured on all hands, did not read it until late in the morning of the 28th. When he did so, he was staggered. In fact, he was completely capsized. Already since his return, he was beginning to be uneasy at the attitude of England. He was relieved and delighted at the Serbian submission. He wrote in the margin of the dispatch, a brilliant performance for a time limit of only 48 hours. This is more than one could have expected. A great moral victory for Vienna, but with it, every reason for war is removed and Gilsh ought to have remained quietly in Belgrade. On the strength of this, I should never have ordered mobilisation. Wilhelm II now thought he had gained what he wanted most of all, a great diplomatic triumph without a shot fired. Once again the Tsar would be rebuffed. Once again the Austrian alliance would have been cemented by faithful German support. This time at least, his reputation in German military circles for firmness could be under no reproach. Regicide Serbia would be chastened in due course with the acquiescence of the powers. There need be no war. He expressed himself ready to negotiate on the basis of a temporary Austrian occupation of Belgrade. He wrote at once to Jago, I am convinced that on the whole the wishes of the Danube monarchy have been acceded to. The few reservations that Serbia makes in regard to individual points can, in my opinion, well be cleared up by negotiation. But it contains the announcement of a capitulation of the most humiliating kind, and with it, every reason for war is removed. Strange Delays If these words had been written 12 hours earlier, they would certainly have stopped the war. 
but now they were too late. At 11 o'clock on this same morning, Tuesday the 28th, almost while the Kaiser was writing his minute and congratulating himself that the danger was past, Count Berthold telegraphed to Belgrade that the Royal Serbian Government, not having answered in a satisfactory manner the note of July the 23rd, 1914, presented by the Austro-Hungarian Minister at Belgrade, Austria-Hungary consequently considered herself henceforward in a state of war with Serbia. There can be no doubt that the German Chancellor and Foreign Minister, led up to a certain point by the Kaiser, had made up their minds to bring about a state of war between Austria and Serbia, with the intention of confronting the powers of the Triple Entente, with an issue on which they must fight or fall apart. They believed and also no doubt sincerely hoped that their rivals would choose the latter alternative. They had braced themselves, however, for the worst contingencies. They knew the impulsive character of the Emperor. They knew his fear of war. They did not intend to give him the opportunity of backsliding at the critical moment. Hence, the routine formality and explicable delays at Berlin. Hence the decision, speed and energy at Vienna. But there must have been some special art practised to keep the text of the Serbian reply from the Kaiser till the sands had run out. It is on this point that Wilhelm II should speak. He was by no means supine in the transaction of business. On the contrary, he discharged his duties with punctuality and superabundant energy. Now if ever was the moment in his reign when these qualities were required, this, of all of the innumerable documents he had dealt with in his reign, was the one which deserved them. How was it that the contents of the box delivered by messenger at Potsdam on the night of the 27th did not meet his eye till a further fatal 12 hours had passed? Confidential secretaries, personal aides de camp, court officials, someone must have been pressed into the service of the Wilhelmstrasse. Was the Kaiser a victim of the same manipulation, which in different forms was applied to both his brother autocrats in Russia and Austria? The searchlights of post-war inquiry, which have lighted more brightly the events of this week than any period in history, should be directed to this dark and carefully shaded spot. The facts remain that the Serbian reply was not read by the man on whose decision the fate of the world still hung until nearly 60 hours after it had been delivered at Belgrade, and that before he could act upon it, the irrevocable declaration of war had gone forth from Vienna. The Austrian Declaration of War Difficulties had been expected in obtaining the Emperor's signature to the Declaration of War against Serbia. When Marguti handed the necessary document to Count Parr, the Count remarked, This may be all right, but all I can say is that men of 84 years of age don't sign war proclamations. Count Berthold had therefore fortified himself by laying before his master at the same time a report that the Serbians had already fired upon Austrian troop steamers on the Danube, and that hostilities had in fact begun. The text submitted to Francis Joseph ended with the words, The more so, as Serbian troops have already attacked a detachment of imperial and royal troops. This was not true, and Berthold, after the Emperor had signed the declaration, erased the sentence, explaining the next day that the report was unconfirmed but he did not give the emperor any chance to review the decision. His policy was perfectly clear. He meant at all costs, by hook or by crook, to declare war on Serbia. In the whole world that was the only thing that counted with him. That was what Germany had urged. That he must have, and that he got. But he got much more too. The second phase. The Austrian declaration of war upon Serbia ended the first phase of the outbreak of Armageddon. The griefs and hatreds of these two countries against each other could now obtain satisfaction by arms. The second phase was the dispute between Germany and Russia about the mobilisation of their armies. The first quarrel was petty but real, the second measureless but technical. Until the Austrian cannon bombarded Belgrade, the control of German policy lay with the Kaiser and his ministers. Once fighting had begun, even in this obscure corner of Europe, the German 
and Russian general staffs predominated. Military reasons cut across and ruptured every diplomatic situation. Moltke and Falkenhayn towered above Bethmann Holvik and Jago, just as the warlike Grand Dukes and Generals at St. Petersburg took charge of the Tsar. Henceforward, the prescribed war plans of the German and Russian empires, and the execution of the successive stages of their mobilizations, became the overpowering theme in both countries. Kaiser and Tsar felt themselves morally gripped by firm seconds, who led them remorselessly to the dueling ground, cautioned them against betraying weakness or nervousness on the field of honour, handed them the pistols and gave the signal to fire upon each other to their mutual destruction. This second phase occupied four days. It ended at 6pm on the 1st of August, when Germany declared war upon Russia. During this period, immense efforts, led by Sir Edward Grey, were made to retrieve the situation. Nearly all the ambassadors in all the great capitals strove earnestly for peace. As this movement developed a spontaneous force, it affected both Bethmann Holvig and Jago. When it became increasingly plain to them from the reports of the German ambassador in London that a general war would find the British Empire ranged with France and Russia, both lent themselves to action which a few days earlier would have dispersed the crisis. The Kaiser, now desperately shaken by the imminence of the explosion, and the Tsar sincerely clinging to peace, interchanged a series of personal telegrams unique in their story of nations. But neither they, nor their ministers, nor all that Grey might do, could regain control of the purely technical measures and countermeasures which the chiefs of armies demanded and took. The first war between Austria and Serbia was about a murder. The second war, which absorbed it, was a war between Germany and Russia about precautions. The third and greatest of all wars, besides which the others were but trivial, the war between Germany and France, was merely consequential and happened almost as a matter of form. The German plan for this third war required the invasion of Belgium, and the invasion of Belgium brought the British Empire united to the field. Nothing in human power could break the fatal chain once it had begun to unroll. A situation had been created where hundreds of officials had only to do their prescribed duty to their respective countries to wreck the world. They did their duty. The British Fleet War having broken out on the Danube, various levers of precaution or preparation were pressed throughout Europe. At five o'clock, we ordered the whole British First Fleet, comprising our 38 best capital ships, to its northern war station at Scarpa Flow. It left Portland at 7am on the morning of the 29th, passed the Straits of Dover during darkness with all precautions, and by midday on the 30th was safely through the narrow seas and in blue water. This movement, which was kept secret till accomplished from all except the Prime Minister, was in no way provocative. The fleet was actually steaming further away from Germany. Nobody could object to that, but it made us quite secure whatever might come. We were in the fortunate position that the one essential step which our own safety required, while it increased our diplomatic influence, did not endanger the immediate safety of others. Paris and London Up till this stage, it had not been certain that Germany and Austria would not gain another bloodless victory, such as rewarded Arenfall five years before. But on this occasion, Germany found herself almost immediately in the presence of a sombre fatalism in the Entente powers. There was a feeling in Paris and London that Germany meant to have war, and meant to have it now. If she did not, it was easy to find half a dozen solutions. Grey indefatigably proposed a conference of the powers, and begged all parties to be reasonable. France abstained from every form of provocation, but there the British and French governments came quite definitely to the end of their resources. If Germany intended war, nothing could stop her. If she was bent on so directing events that the long-threatened, long-dreaded hour must strike, then she would have her way. There could not, for instance, be any question of France begging Russia to give in for the sake of peace, or of Great Britain telling France or Russia that they would certainly be left alone if they chose to fight. 
The two great Western powers felt that if Germany would relieve them of all responsibility and would, of her own initiative and at her own moment, bring successfully Russia, France and Great Britain into one united front against her, they could not help it. They must face whatever was coming to them. Believing themselves about to become the objects of deliberate aggression and seeing their all-powerful opponent putting himself hopelessly in the wrong, the one thing they would not do was to repudiate each other. To do this might avert the war for the time being. It would leave each of them to face the next crisis alone. They did not dare to separate. They awaited with bated breath, but stern hearts, the further steps that Germany might choose to take. The scene must now be shifted to St. Petersburg. We have seen how nicely Berthold had timed his ultimatum so as to make sure that President Poincaré should have sailed before news of it arrived in Russia. Monsieur Sazanov, the Russian foreign minister, had however a premonition. Instead of going to bed after the leave-taking, he drove to the foreign office, where he learned that a most important dispatch from Vienna was being deciphered. It was the ultimatum. St. Petersburg The next morning found Russia and Austria face to face. The deepest feelings of the Slav race were aroused. The wounds of the Bosnian crisis five years before still ached. The visit of the French president, gone but yesterday, gave confidence. Russian society, military and political, was gathered in the capital, and large numbers of notables thronged the court. Nevertheless, the decisions of the ministerial council, held on the 24th, were studiously restrained. No military steps were taken, but the Minister of War was authorised to prepare, in case of necessity, orders for a partial mobilisation against Austria. A manifesto was published declaring that Russia could not remain indifferent to the fate of Serbia, and Vienna was earnestly asked to extend the time limit of 48 hours to enable discussion to proceed. The German ambassador, still Portales, of the Bosnia crisis, informed Sazanov that Austria-Hungary could not accept interference in her differences with Serbia, and Germany, also on her side, could not accept a suggestion which would be contrary to the dignity of her ally as a great power. Sazanov rejoined, We shall not leave Serbia alone in her struggle against Austria. The next day arrived the Austrian refusal to extend the time limit. On this, Cesar, presiding over his Council of State, ordered immediate proclamation of the preparatory state corresponding to Germany's threatening danger of war and to our own precautionary period and of martial law in fortresses and on the frontier. He also authorised his foreign minister to issue, when he deemed it necessary, the orders already in preparation for partial mobilisation against Austria. Problems of the Russian mobilisation but now occurred one of those technical difficulties of which statesmen should be better informed beforehand. The Russian general staff was horrified at the form of partial mobilisation sanctioned by their government. They exclaimed that it would derange the plans for general mobilisation if, as they believed, war with Germany as well as with Austria should ensue. Even against Austria alone, the southern districts would provide 13 corps only, instead of the 16 their war plans required. In particular, the mobilisation of the Warsaw region, not hitherto ordered, must be included in any coherent precautions against Austria. They complained vehemently that the partial mobilisation which had been approved was a political measure it would confuse their railway movements and be deeply injurious should the supreme danger supervene. General Yanushkevich shook Sazanov with his solid arguments. He was supported by all the principal staff officers and by the quartermaster general, Danilov. It was agreed that the two Ukases should be prepared for the Tsar design, one for partial and the other for general mobilisation, and that final decision which to use should be held in suspense. On this, Yanushkevich warned Jelinsky, the commander at Warsaw, that the 30th of July would be announced as the first day of Russian general mobilisation. On the expiry of her ultimatum and the departure of Baron Gilsch from Belgrade on the evening of July the 25th, Austria had ordered the mobilisation of eight corps, half the Imperial Army, against Serbia, 
with the 28th as the first day of mobilisation. Although this measure was aimed solely at Serbia, it affected military districts in the north of the empire, like Prague, from which troops were to move to the Serbian frontier. Thus the Russians had grounds for believing that preparations were also on foot against them. The Austrian declaration of war, following these disturbing reports, determined Sazanov to act upon the discretion accorded him three days before. He therefore sanctioned the partial mobilisation and informed the German government, with many disclaimers of any hostile intent towards them, that the Odessa, Kiev, Moscow and Kazan military areas would be beginning to mobilise on the 29th. Jago had stated on the 27th, both to the British and Russian ambassadors in Berlin, that if Russia mobilised only in the south, Germany would not mobilise, but if she mobilised in the north, or if Russian troops entered Austrian territory, Germany would have to do so too. Thus Sasanov had not only reason to take precautions against Austria, but the right to believe that these would not involve Germany in countermeasures. Meanwhile, the temperature was rising fast. On the afternoon of the 29th, the news that the Austrian monitors had begun the bombardment of Belgrade roused Russian public and official opinion to fever heat. About the same time, the German ambassador informed Sazanov that further continuance of Russian measures of mobilisation would force Germany to mobilise and that a European war could then scarcely be prevented. The situation of the Russian minister was painful in the extreme. Austria had rejected all his proposals. Germany forbade all pressure upon her ally. Every word of encouragement or comradeship had been studiously avoided by England. The military chiefs, on whom the life of Russia might depend in a few days, were unanswerable in their technical sphere. Germany had retracted her promise to remain impassive, if the Russians mobilised only against Austria. The guns were firing on the Danube, and the attack upon Serbia had actually begun. Sasanov resisted the military men no more. There remained only the Kaiser. Tsar and Kaiser Late on the night of the 28th, the Tsar had sent his personal telegram to the Kaiser. I'm glad you are back. In this most serious moment, I appeal to you to help me. An ignoble war has been declared to a weak country. The indignation in Russia, shed fully by me, is enormous. I foresee that very soon I shall be overwhelmed by the pressure brought upon me and be forced to take extreme measures which will lead to war. To try and avoid such a calamity as a European war, I beg you, in the name of our old friendship, to do what you can to stop your allies from going too far. Nicky. On the morning of the 29th, he received a telegram from the Kaiser, sent independently a little before his own, saying that the Kaiser fully understood how difficult it was for the Tsar and his government to face the trend of public opinion. Therefore, with regard to the hearty and tender friendship which binds us both from long ago with firm ties, I am exerting my utmost influence to induce the Austrians to deal straightly to arrive at a satisfactory understanding with you. I confidently hope you will help me in my efforts to smooth over difficulties that may still arise. Your very sincere and devoted friend and cousin, Willie. Both these telegrams are in English. They seem to offer a new hope of peace. But even this intimate tie of the sovereigns, each of his throne and dynasty at stake, could not withstand the hourly increasing strain of the military measures. Sometime during the morning of the 29th, both Ukases from mobilisation, partial and general, were presented to the Tsar by General Yanushkevich. It seems probable, though not certain, that after long and strenuous arguments, the Tsar signed both. At any rate, Dobrolovsky, the chief of mobilisation, during the afternoon of the 29th, obtained the signatures of the various high authorities as prescribed by the Russian constitution, to an order for general mobilisation approved by the Tsar. This task was not completed till 8 o'clock, and the general, having cleared the telegraph lines, was about to give the decisive signal, when he received a definite order from the Tsar cancelling general mobilisation and offering only partial mobilisation. The Tsar's efforts for peace Nicholas II was still struggling for peace. He had telegraphed again to the Kaiser, 
thanking him for his conciliatory and friendly messages, and ending, it would be right to give over the Austro-Serbian problem to the Hague Convention. Trust in your wisdom and friendship. At 9.40pm on the 29th, the reply of the Kaiser to the Tsar's first telegram arrived. It suggested that Russia should remain a spectator of the Austro-Serbian conflict without involving Europe in the most horrible war she ever witnessed. He advocated a direct understanding between the Russian and Austrian governments and promised to promote it. Although this was no concession at all by Germany on the main issue, it had affected Nicholas II sufficiently to induce him to countermand the general mobilisation. He even tried to stop the partial mobilisation, but both Sasanov and Yanushkevich convinced him that this was impossible. At 1.20am he replied to the Kaiser, Thank you heartily for your quick answer. The military measures which have come into force were decided five days ago for reasons of defence on account of Austria's preparations. I hope from all my heart that these measures won't in any way interfere with your part as mediator, which I greatly value. We need your strong pressure on Austria to come to an understanding with us. None of these internal Russian perturbations were apparent to Berlin. The German general staff had full and punctual information of most of what was being done in the various Russian military districts. Although the formal order, even for partial mobilisation, was not dispatched till midnight on the 29th, the commanders concerned warned informally by the general staff in their professional zeal and lively expectation of war were already making all kinds of preparations in anticipation of the order which they expected momentarily to receive. All such preparations were reported to Berlin. They involved, for instance, the Warsaw area, as well as the southern commands of which Germany had been officially informed by the Russian government. Since the 29th, Moltke had urged the sending of an ultimatum to Russia, and Falkenhayn had demanded the proclamation of Drahende Kriegsführer. When on the 30th, the Russian formal announcement of the partial mobilisation was received, the Kaiser agreed to this. Threatening danger of war was proclaimed. This measure was virtually equivalent to the first two days of general mobilisation. That is to say, it set in motion a vast number of processes that would in any case have been taken upon a decree of general mobilisation. It must not be supposed, however, that the military commanders throughout Germany had remained inert during the last three or four days. Like their Russian counterparts, each wished to be forward in every preparation, and all the military centres were humming with activity. Reports of all this, carried back to Russia, decided Sazanov and the military authorities that general mobilisation could be delayed no longer. By an immense concerted effort, they prevailed upon the Tsar at 4pm on the 30th of July to sign a new ukase of general mobilisation, and an hour later all the military centres were so informed. General mobilisation in Russia Shortly before noon on the 31st of July, the news of the Russian general mobilisation reached Berlin. At 3.30, an ultimatum was sent to Russia, declaring that, if Russia did not, within 12 hours, cease every war measure against us and Austria-Hungary, and make to us a definite declaration to that effect, the German mobilisation would be ordered. This summons was delivered at midnight on the 31st of July. At 6pm on August 1st, Germany declared war on Russia. It is strange to reflect that on this very day, Sir Edward Grey had at last reached a complete agreement with the German Foreign Office upon a form of direct negotiation between Austria and Russia. The cause of quarrel had disappeared on paper at the same time as the fighting all over Europe begun. The British preparations kept pace with these grave developments. At the Cabinet on the morning of the 30th, moved by Captain Hankey, the Secretary of the Committee of Imperial Defence, I asked and obtained sanction for the putting into force of the precautionary period, which the War Office ordered at 2.10pm. At the same time as this was done, I authorised the Admiralty to send the warning telegram to the fleets. This last had only become a formality. Apart from the recall of the reservists of the third fleet ships, all our naval arrangements, so far as we could see them, were complete. 
Germany and France. The war of Austria upon Serbia, about the murder of the Archduke, and other grievances had begun. The second war, of far graver character, had broken out between Germany and Russia, about the mobilisation of the Russian armies against Austria. The Eastern Front was aflame. But now the third and greatest spread of the conflagration must follow. The German general staff had no fears about Russia at the outset. They could easily have waited for two or three days before taking any measure against her. All their thoughts were turned on France. Since the war had come, they must attack France without delay. The six brigades straining at the leash beyond the frontier must violate Belgium neutrality and seize Liège from the second day of mobilisation. Not a moment could be lost. Accordingly, Germany on the 31st of July informed France of her ultimatum to Russia and asked the French government to declare within 18 hours whether it intended to remain neutral in a Russo-German war. Belgium was also invited to afford clear passage to the German armies about to invade France. There was of course no quarrel between Germany and France, and a treaty of guarantee between Germany and Belgium. These difficulties had to be surmounted properly. The German ambassador in Paris was therefore instructed, if contrary to expectation, France should declare an intention of remaining neutral, to demand the surrender of the fortresses of Toul and Verdun as a pledge of neutrality. This demand, like asking Great Britain to hand over Portsmouth and Dover, was intended to make sure that there could be no backing out by France. Any such improper behaviour on her part would have been most embarrassing to Germany, whose armies had already started. The French Prime Minister, Monsieur Viviani, however, replied forthwith, according to the formula agreed upon in his cabinet, that France would act according to her interests. You have a treaty of alliance with Russia, have you not? Quite so, replied Viviani. Nothing could be more correct and debonair, and the German ambassador was thus relieved from delivering the second and contingent part of his message about Toul and Verdun. Monsieur Viviani escorted his visitor to his car. Nothing more of significance passed between the two countries. Germany declared war on France at 6.45pm on the 3rd of August, and the next morning the German vanguards broke into the Duchy of Luxembourg in contravention of the various treaties which protected it, on their way to march across Belgium to the invasion of France. The Belgian king and people, threatened with instant assault, appealed for aid to Great Britain and France as joint guarantors with Germany of her neutrality. August 4th, 1914 When these events became apparent to the British cabinet and parliament during August 2nd and 3rd, an ultimatum was sent to Germany forbidding her to violate the Belgian frontiers and requiring her to withdraw at once any troops who may have done so. Answer was required by midnight on the 4th. The answer was a refusal and the continued march of the German armies. At midnight, therefore, by German time on the 4th of August, Great Britain, in full unity with all the dominions and dependencies of the British Empire, declared war upon Germany. The Burden of Responsibility It is impossible to recount these events in the light of all we know without once again trying to apportion responsibility. We have described the slow, half-conscious growth of European antagonisms in the quarter century before the catastrophe. We have seen how the mine was slowly loaded. We are now concerned with the guilt of firing it. After all, it need never have been fired. A war postponed may be a war prevented. The combinations of states vary as years pass. The Entente or alliances of one decade may have lost their savour in the next. Time and peace solve many problems, and men's thoughts move on to new spheres. Terrible before the history of a thousand years is the burden of those who let this blast of misery and devastation loose upon the thoughtless world. We must not allow ourselves to be baffled by the immense volume of knowledge now accessible upon the immediate coming of the war. Everything has been laid bare. The Gooch Tempoli official documents reveal the whole conduct of Great Britain. Even the German writer Ludwig 
affirms that there is no substantial discrepancy between these full post-war disclosures and the voluminous blue book published within a few months at the beginning of the struggle. The archives of the German, Austrian and Russian empires have been ruthlessly exposed by revolutionary governments, each anxious to condemn the old regime, or at least unconcerned to protect it. Not only dispatches and telegrams, but office memoranda, the records of informal conversations between diplomats or military men, the marginal scribblings of the Kaiser, all are now in world-open print. There is no lack of material. It is its plethora that obstructs judgment. To read many modern writers, one would suppose that the war came by itself and that no person in authority even thought of such a wicked thing. Bertolt did this, and Conrad that, and Jager was on his honeymoon, and Chichersky was snubbed by the Kaiser, and Bethman Holvig did not understand the situation, and the Russians got excited and Moltke alarmed, and then all of a sudden, all the greatest nations in the world fell upon each other with fire and sword. It was a case of spontaneous combustion. The theory that it all happened by itself, that Germany carelessly gave Austria a blank check to correct Serbia, that Russia was indignant at the spectacle, that Germany was alarmed because Russia mobilised, that France and England did not tell Russia she must give in, that England did not tell Germany in time that she would fight, that all Berthold wanted was his little private war with Serbia, that all Germany wanted was not to be forced to desert her ally, that all the Kaiser wanted was a diplomatic triumph. All these cases find ample documentary support. Still, Certain stark facts, which no elaboration can veil, stand forth for all time. Berthold and his circle meant to use armed violence against Serbia. The Kaiser encouraged and urged them to do so. Both parties knew that such an event must arouse not only the Tsar and his government, but the Russian nation. Both decided to accept the risk and whatever else it might entail. The Kaiser, having given Berthold and Vienna a free hand, deliberately absented himself until the ultimatum to Serbia had been dispatched. The German Chancellor and Foreign Secretary instructed their ambassadors to declare that Germany considered the ultimatum right and proper, before they had even seen its terms. When the Serbians returned a soft answer, Jago and others delayed the presentation of this document to the Kaiser, until it was too late for him to prevent Austria declaring war on Serbia. Berthold issued his declaration of war with precipitate haste and obtained its signature from the Emperor Francis Joseph, partly under false pretenses. Every request for delay was refused by Vienna. Every proposal, whether for conference of the powers or direct negotiations between Austria and Russia, was refused or resisted until too late. At St Petersburg, the Russian government, court and military men extracted first a partial and then a complete mobilisation decree from the reluctant Tsar. Germany fastened upon Russia a deadly quarrel about her mobilisation. Germany sent an ultimatum to Russia requiring her to cancel it within 12 hours. At this moment, the German mobilisation, although not officially proclaimed, was already in progress. Germany declared war on Russia Germany summoned France to repudiate the terms of the Franco-Russian alliance and hand over to Germany, keeping her key fortresses as gauges of faithful neutrality. Germany declared war upon France. Germany violated the treaty protecting the Duchy of Luxembourg. Germany violated the neutrality of Belgium. When Belgium resisted, Germany declared war upon Belgium and marched across Belgium to the invasion of France. It was not till then that Great Britain declared war upon Germany, and we are still disinclined to say that she was wrong. 